Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Mind Muscle Connection podcast. Today, I have a very special guest back on the podcast, Martin Rafalo. He is back on for, I think, the fourth time now. Last time we had him on was like sometime, I think, September ish. Um, so it's been about six to eight months since uh, we've had you on. So, uh, Martin, welcome back on, man. Thanks for having me back on, Jeff. Uh, always a pleasure to be here. Yeah, absolutely, man. I th- like I said, I think the fourth time. So, definitely get some mm-hmm. good feedback when you come on. So, I uh, appreciate you taking time out of your day to, to hop back on here. I know you said you've had a busy couple weeks and just kind of looking at on social media media, it looks like you've been traveling a little bit. So maybe just give a little update, you know, on yourself and uh, if you want to maybe touch on training as well too. Yeah. So recently I have been away with some colleagues from JPS uh, Health and Fitness here in Melbourne, Australia. We were in Singapore and Jakarta and we were presenting our science to gym floor course. Uh, so we were away for about 12 days. I think seven of those days were spent uh, presenting and essentially working. So it has been a pretty uh, busy time and yeah i think i've only just kind of recovered uh from all the jet lag and uh, i've gotten back into routine which is good and you know we're speaking off air about how i've recently just started the final uh, study of my phd so as soon as i got back got straight into that so i haven't really had much downtime since as you could imagine working with so many participants and having to work around their schedule so Participants basically become your boss when you're you're running a study and you've got no choice but to do the times that they can do, but that's fine. I'm I'm accustomed to that. Uh, you know, I've been at personal training for a while now, so I, I get how that all works. Uh so yeah, that's that's been the the story over the past uh weeks and months. And with training, whilst we were away, we we definitely uh tried our best to to continue training. We had we had some pretty good gyms, or at least we had access to some pretty good gyms in in Singapore. Um, Jakarta was a bit hit and miss. So for those that don't know, Jakarta's in Indonesia. Uh, it's a third world country. You know, not a lot, I guess, going on there. I mean, it is a city and it's a productive city, but you know, independent of that, it's uh, it's a little bit uh, messy, if you will, at least for uh, a foreigner. So yeah, since being back, uh, it's been awesome to be to be back into routine and training with the guys here at JPS. Sometimes you take for granted how much the environment has an influence on your ability to train and to push and to just be motivated. So, you know, being back, back at JPS training with the guys, um, has been, has been awesome. And yeah, I think, uh, we were speaking again before that, you know, time management and making sure that, you know, I balance uh, my study commitments with my work commitments with my own training goals. Um, I mean, it's, I don't think it's possible to find the, the perfect balance, but, um, over the coming month that that's going to be the challenge is to, you know, continue prioritizing all three just to some extent and uh, ensuring that one doesn't get too too compromised. That's going to be me for the for the coming months. Awesome, man. Yeah, no, it sounds really cool. And I'm sure it's cool to be able to like travel like that to other countries and be able to, you know, speak and, um, you know, mm-hmm. t- teach others. So, so that's awesome. And then from the training standpoint, you know, obviously super busy with, you know, obviously PhD, that's very time consuming, traveling, work, you know, and then, you know, all, all those things. For training, uh, you know, What's that kind of looking like for you? Uh, I know, again, I think we touched on it a little bit, but that was, you know, six, eight months ago yeah. now at this point. So like, is it, is, is things, you know, obviously if you've gotten further into this, have you changed anything in terms of how you've like kind of programmed recently or anything like that, or is it still uh, fairly similar there? Yeah, more or less the same. Um, I, I aim to get four days in per week, usually training legs about once, once a week and then upper for the remaining three days. I find that I can maintain size or muscle mass in my lower body with a very low amount of volume um with with not much and i can you know generally maintenance volume for most people is going to be obviously a lot lower than what it's going to take to build muscle but comparing my legs to my upper body i have noticed that to be different and my legs do seem to respond uh quite well at least better than than my upper body does um that's what i've noticed over the years so that's the way I split up my training. Um, recently, I've been persuaded to also uh, test or max out my deadlift because um, at JPS, we're having an open day in like 10 days now. Um, and so it's for charity and we need people to lift heavy. And considering I've got a lot of guys here doing my study, participating in my study, I put my hand up for the the one rep max deadlift. Um, so now I'm I'm incorporating the sumo deadlift into my, to my program I've only got three sessions that I can fit in before the the actual testing day. Um, so luckily, luckily I, I have good mechanics for for a deadlift. Like it just feels like for a sumo deadlift, it just feels good. And 
whenever I take an extended period off deadlifting, I can generally come back and pick it up really quickly. So the last time I deadlifted was probably back in 2019, um, potentially even 2018. Um, and I did my first session about two days ago, felt pretty good, worked up to 200 kilos for one, felt good. It didn't really just felt like my technique was lifting the weight. Like I didn't really feel like my musculature or my strength was really having to have much of an input, which was interesting. And just goes to show that, you know, even if you haven't trained a lift for a while, if you haven't completed a specific exercise for a while, building muscle in areas that contribute to that movement, at least if you're... your technique is you're competent enough with your technique pays off in the long run because I haven't been deadlifting, but I have been doing heavy Romanian deadlifts and heavy leg presses. All the musculature that has been built there obviously carries over, plays a role in the sumo deadlift. And like I said earlier, my technique doesn't really seem to to kind of subside or fade away when I stop deadlifting. And I think I also put that down to teaching the deadlift so often throughout the week. Like I have so many clients who I, who sumo, I'm kind of constantly observing and watching that technique, cueing through it. I think that really helps just ingrain the, the movement pattern. Yeah, like I'd hypothesize that, that it would it would help. And so that's where we're at now. So I've got two more sessions to do, two more heavy sessions to do before the, the testing day. And I'm hoping to beat my previous one rep max, which was 245 for one on the sumo. So fingers crossed I can do that in just uh, three three sessions. Yeah, that would be, that would be pretty crazy to think that like, you know, if, if you were able to do that, uh, in, in just three sessions, um, mm. like, like you said, I'm sure, you know, the fact that you, you teach it all the time, that's obviously going to be super important, but like you said, I mean, you've still been doing RDLs and like leg presses. And so like RDLs yeah. obviously aren't like exactly the sumo deadlift, but you know, it, there's, there's definitely some carry over there. Sure. And, you know, I think for people that, you know, maybe are into like powerlifting or something like that, that's, you know, for them, that's a good sign that, Hey, like if you just focus on building muscle and like, you don't Mm -hmm. actually train that lift for a little Mm -hmm. bit of time, like you could theoretically, you know, like progress. Mm -hmm. And then you just basically at that point, it's just like, you know, you just got to practice the skill of it a little bit, which is just really going to be the biggest thing probably for you now is just getting that skill down for the next couple of weeks. So that's really cool. Yeah. That's, that's really cool that, um, you know, that, that could be something that you could, you could theoretically do. So for training, um, again, you know, the time management aspect of it for you, um, which sounds like you're managing it pretty well, but is there anything maybe that during this period of time that, and again, you may have, maybe you've had like more busy times in your life uh, in the past, but do you find that, has there been anything that you've picked up in terms of like time management aspect for like your training or anything that maybe you've like Mm. placed a greater like emphasis on during this period of time to make sure that, you know, you still have good training sessions, but you obviously can still, you know, put time into the other aspects uh, that you have to focus on. Yeah. I I think for the most part, making sure that I get the most out of each set I perform. So because I am on a relatively low volume program at the moment compared to what I'd usually do to to build muscle, the importance of getting the most out of each set only increases. And what I mean by this is making sure you're accurate with your training intensity, right? How how hard are you actually pushing your sets? Um, Now, of course, this is also going to depend on how aroused you are and your mental state at any given point, especially when when you're training, right? So what I mean by this is I could I could get up now, go downstairs and do a set to failure on the leg press. And we could argue that that would be my maximal effort. And in that given point in time, it, it would be, but I don't really feel like training right now. My arousal levels aren't very high and just not in the mood because it's quite early. And I don't enjoy training early. So I would still be pushing to failure. But if I did the session did, did, did the session in the afternoon and actually increased my arousal, got myself in the in the right headspace, I could push to failure again. You could probably imagine how the stimulus achieved, although I'm pushing to the same proximity to failure in each of those sessions, would be a little bit different. So what I'm trying to say is with my current workload and, you know, the time that I have and the current state of arousal and mentality, you know, driving my training. I'm trying to get the most out of each set that I perform. So making sure that each set is accurate, pushing close to failure in regards to time management strategies, supersetting, and also incorporating rest pause sets. So that's something that I've been uh, trialing recently a lot with myself and, and my clients. Um, so allowing me to, again, squeeze in more volume and at least reps that I think will be stimulating of, of hypertrophy in a shorter amount of time, things like that. Uh, I'm trying to be a little more uh, wary about. Um, and if I had a higher volume program, if I was following a high volume program, my state of arousal was a little bit higher, then things might be r- a little bit uh, different, I suppose. But because my goals right now, uh, at least in, at this point, you know, just coming back from from my time away, it's really just to build 
my capacity back up and get myself accustomed to a good training routine again. Um, I'm really not overly concerned about some of the finer variables. It's just a matter of getting my training routine back into place, which is feeling really good um, and getting me to a point where I can start bringing my volume back up to pre holiday levels um as you could imagine i was you know quite sore getting back into the gym last week after still training so so did some sessions over the the 12 14 day period but when you're away it's just at least with what we had available it's just not the same as what what training is like back back at home yeah no that's cool yeah uh rest pause sets like you said and then just really making sure that you're you're getting the most out of like each rep and set too Mm -hmm. you know just because you you do have don't have as you know your your time's a little bit more limited during Mm -hmm. this so we'll kind of hit on fatigue throughout this but have you because you're you know maybe you you do have to like your quality has to be a little bit higher but with everything else you have going on do you find that you have to like, can you get closer to failure? Do you stay like further away to manage fatigue or what does that mm. kind of look like for you right now? Yeah, well, well, like I said, I can get close to failure, but I know that with a different state of arousal and a different headspace and a different external and environmental influence, I would be able to push harder. Like it would still be uh, like, let's say I pushed to a two RIR today. I know I could also push to a two RIR on another day if I was in a, in a better space generally. And so I would be able to achieve a, a higher, a higher stimulus that way. So I'm, I'm training within my own, with, I'm training to best degree possible, or at least close to it within the current constraints that I have. So I usually speak about the bucket analogy when I'm presenting, you know, our, our course and I speak about how, you know, training stress and life stress and all the fatigue that comes along with that gets poured into the same you know, stress bucket, your body somewhat struggles to differentiate between stress because at the end of the day, stress is just characterized by the release of certain hormones in the body. And eventually that that bucket's going to overflow. And and the size of that bucket though can be different based on individual to individual and based on nutritional status, sleep, et cetera. So for me, it's it's a matter of maintaining the size of my bucket, right? By ensuring get enough sleep and ensuring I'm staying on top of my nutrition and doing all those little things that really add up over time, then ensuring that my training stress and general life stress aren't accumulating to the point where, you know, the bucket overflows because I've, I've been there in the past and I know, you know, where my ceiling is at. And I think that's, that's the, that's a benefit of actually pushing yourself really hard and not being afraid to, I guess, test the limits and, and potentially experience that bucket overflowing at some point, you know, I've definitely been there before. I think um, the study we speak about today uh, the study we speak about soon, I conducted it about this point last year. And I spent every day in the gym for like two months, I think minus like one or two days. I was in the gym every day for two months because I had to. And I think the bucket started to <laughs> overflow at some point. So I know where that, where that maximum point is. And I think that that changes over time. Like you can probably tolerate more over time. Uh, at least that's what I'm experiencing. And That's the way I visualize or at least conceptualize managing, you know, training stress with with life stress comes down to maintaining the size of that bucket with your sleep and your nutrition, hydration, et cetera. Then, you know, being smart about what you're what you're pouring uh, into it. A lot of this also comes down to perception. So a lot of the stress we experience is highly based on our perception. And over time, I think I've gotten a lot better at not making a problem out of something that isn't a problem yet in the process of doing that, not being as stressed as I usually would be. And that obviously ensures that the integrity of my bucket you know, doesn't get damaged. And I think that has helped along the way as well. So, you know, I do a lot to prepare myself for upcoming days, right? So that I don't perceive those days to be as stressful. So it's little things like that that I've only learned through experience to do that I think are helping this time around. And I hope that after I settle back into my training, my routine is back to where it needs to be. I can really start pushing my training harder and harder, even with all the things that I've got going on. Because I think I have better better strategies at this point uh, being employed to ensure that, you know, that bucket doesn't overflow. Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, I, I love that analogy because, again, a lot of people just think it's like just training stress or whatever, but it is, you know, like everything else as well too goes into that bucket. Uh-huh. So, yeah, no, that's that. I, I love that analogy. So, cool, man. Well, let's let's talk about, let's dive into your um, paper that was recently published. We did, <laughs> excuse me, we did talk about it last time you were on the podcast, um, but I'm sure there's some new things. And like you said, you mm-hmm. can be a little bit more confident now in the results and everything like that. So yep. we'll dive into it. The, the title of it was Influence of Resistance Training Proximity to Failure Determined by Repetitions in Reverse on Neuromuscular Fatigue and Resistance Trained Males and Females. And uh, you guys had a pretty good uh, 
list here of authors as well too. Eric Helms was on there, Eric Trexler, so a couple uh, well known guys in, in in the field as well too. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll hand it over to you, and um, you know if there's any findings that you want to share, or just really the overview of it and whatnot, and we'll we'll go from there. Yeah, this was a, a study I conducted at about this point last year, first original research study. So what I mean by this is it was the first study that I had designed from scratch and conducted uh, out of JPS Health and Fitness on my own, really, of course, with the help of my supervisory team and the help of my great participants. It was really fun to do. Previously, I'd been involved in research that required me to be seated at a computer desk and you know, analyze data, et cetera, which I also enjoy doing. But no doubt, I'd much rather be spending my time on the gym floor, right? And I know that both, both scenarios are required for productive research in the long run. You do have to spend time behind a computer screen. You do have to spend time on the gym floor. But it was really cool to, to be on the gym floor, putting my ideas to the test. And really, the, the goal here was to test the claim that fatigue during resistance training becomes disproportionate as you get closer to failure. So over the years, we, we, we've we heard claims, you know, Jeff, you may have heard claims that, you know, follow these lines. So, you know, fatigue becomes exponential as you get to failure, uh, more disproportionate, or, you know, fit, you, you get more and more fatigued as you get closer to failure. Uh, these are claims that we've, we've heard over the years and intuitively they make sense, right? But it isn't enough to be intuitively confident about claims, at least not if you want a worldview that is grounded in truth. So, you know, in the fitness industry, for example, there have been many claims over the years that have seemed to make sense, right, but have been refuted by research, right? So what comes to mind? Well, maybe fasted cardio, right? We know now that that's not necessary for fat loss. And if we compare fasted cardio with cardio completed at other points in the day, we don't see a difference between the two protocols, right? Even lifting heavy to build muscle, we now know you can uh, experience muscle hypertrophy lifting lighter loads too. So these claims make sense, but research seems to contest them. So what I'm trying to say is that we shouldn't gauge the quality or the validity of an idea by our capacity to just make sense of it. Some ideas will make sense, but won't be practically effective. So what I wanted to do was put that to the test. And interestingly, although we have a lot of previous research that looks into the effect of proximity to failure on fatigue, a lot of this research has been conducted in a way in which dichotomizes failure training versus non-failure training. Now, this is something that we may have touched on in the past, but it's important to realize that when you do this, when you compare a group of participants trained to failure with a group of participants um, arbitrarily training to a non-failure point, you're, you're then unable to derive any interpretations about how proximity to failure itself influences fatigue because you've just got this non-failure point and this failure point and all we can say from previous research, particularly a meta-analysis by Vieira, which came out in 2021, I think, is that failure training is more fatiguing than non-failure training, right? And does that map onto the claim that we um, discussed earlier where we said, you know, fatigue becomes disproportionate as we get closer to failure? Not so much. Like, yes, we know train to failure is fatigue more fatiguing than keeping an arbitrary, arbitrary number of reps in reserve, but we're not sure exactly what that relationship looks like on a continuous level, right? So instead of dichotomizing and separating these two uh, groups, what I wanted to do was I wanted to look at proximity to failure itself in a continuous manner. And so I compared participants training at a three RIR, right? a one RIR and to the point of momentary muscular failure. So this way we actually have like a continuous scale now that we can work with and plot the relationship across, you know, three different uh, time points essentially within a set, right? Three different proximities to failure within a set. And also, although RIR and RPE are quite popular strategies now to be employed in practice, there haven't been many studies that have actually employed these strategies and looked at their effects on fatigue, right? So one of the novel aspects about my study is not only the fact that we're now looking at proximity, proximity to failure on a continuous level, but also the fact that I'm using RIR prescription, which is quite a common approach in practice, using that in research to monitor and control the proximity to failure achieved. That that was the, the basis for the study. And 
what I did to conduct the study was I, I recruited 24 resistance trained individual. Now, another limitation of previous research is that a majority of studies in this area, and for, for that matter, most areas in exercise science have been conducted on males. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to recruit 24 participants, but I wanted 12 to be males, 12 to be females, because I also think that there may be some sex differences that can be teased out here. And considering that all the previous research in this area, or at least a large majority of it, has been conducted in males, well, we need to include females in research because you know the effects may be variable across sexes. So I don't know the number off the top of my head, but I think about 60% of like exercise science research is conducted in males. I could be wrong about that, but I know it's it's roughly around that area. So my sample of males had just over eight years of resistance training experience, and they had a bench press um, one rep max of about 116 kilos, right? So it was the bench press exercise that I um, conducted this study on. And so what I did was I tested their one rep max uh, because they had to meet a certain threshold as well to be included in the study. And so I would say that it, that was quite an intermediate to advanced level of participants. My females had just over seven years of resistance training experience. So still pretty uh, well trained, no doubt about that, with a one rep max of about 55 kilos. So I would say I had a fairly even sample of both males and females, which allows us to see whether or not the response to you know performing resistance training to a given proximal failure is different between um, sexes. That was another novel aspect of the study. And a usual follow-up question to that is, you know, if you included females in your study, how did you control for the menstrual cycle, right? Because we know that the menstrual cycle may have some sort of influence. So that's a common question I get. It's a fair question and it's definitely something that researchers have to consider and potentially one of the reasons why female participation rates are a little bit lower in exercise science research because it may be easier to just recruit males where hormones are less of of a um, consideration. So what I did was I ensured that all my female participants, at least the ones that were menstruating, started the trial period in their in the follicular phase of their menstrual cycle. So they all started at roughly the same point where the hormonal balance doesn't seem to affect uh, performance and recovery. And they went on from there. And if they experienced their period at any point throughout the study and the symptoms they experienced disabled them from training to the best degree possible, we just rescheduled the trial. So there were a few considerations that were implemented to stay on top of that. It really wasn't that difficult to uh, coordinate. And I think researchers should be more open to doing so in the future because it just takes a little bit of planning and coordination with the participants and considerations can be made that will allow female participation rates to increase in research. So so again, that's that's kind of the, the basis of the study and how it differs to previous research. So at face value, it may seem like a study that is just testing a claim that we already seem to think is true. But like I said, research allows us to then work out whether or not that claim is actually accurate and quantify actual differences between the conditions of interest. And that's what I was able to do with with this study. Awesome. Yeah. So it sounds like, you know, in the, in the past, the research on failure was like, it was either, hey, you, you went to failure or it was non-failure. But the problem was you don't really know what that non-failure is, right? Like it could have been like 10 RAR or it could have been five or it could have yeah. been two or one, right? So, exactly. you wanted, yeah. so you wanted to make sure that it was, hey, this is what, you know, when we say non-failure, Failure, we need to specify what that mm -hmm. is because that is going to make mm -hmm. a big difference. Um, so I think that's sure. awesome. And then, and then the sex differences as well too, right? Like you said, it was all the research in the past was mostly just men. And now you wanted to add mm -hmm. in some um, females as well too in this to see if there was going to be any difference there, which, you know, will be interesting to find out uh, what that was. So um, I'll hand it over back to you in terms of, you know, uh, anything else you want to go uh, through with this uh, moving forward, if there's any, the findings and all yeah. that. Yeah. Well, I guess you're right in saying that that's what I want to do. I want to move away from the standard classical comparison between failure and non-failure training. That comparison in research, I think has led a lot of people to also dichotomize failure and non-failure training in practice. And so looking at things on the level of proximity to failure has much better carryover right, from research to practice. The limitation to that, however, is that employing 
RIR prediction in both research and practice as a set termination strategy is its effectiveness is con- contingent on the accuracy of the individual's predictions in the first place, right? This is another common criticism that, yeah, this is this is a common criticism that RIR prescription or prediction uh, gets. It's that, you know, employing a certain RIR target um, is sometimes redundant because individuals will either underpredict, usually underpredict, maybe sometimes overpredict their RIR. So when I say underpredict, I mean instead of having you know two reps in the reserve, they may have five reps in reserve, and so they're simply not training hard enough to stimulate the response that is that that you're after, right? As per the RIR target that was prescribed in the first place. So what I did to ensure that. I not only not only familiarized my participants with RIR prediction before the trials commenced, but to actually see where they were at so that I could then release this data and show that the participants I had in this study, which used RIR prediction, were either accurate or not accurate with their predictions, right? The, the sample that I had, um, all but one of the individuals had experience predicting RIR. Right, so they had all used an RIR or an RPE scale in practice. Out of 24 participants, 23 had experience uh, terminating their sets based on an RIR or RPE prescription. And they were all trained, right? So they had all trained to failure in the past at at some point, and they uh, regularly did reach that point on some exercises. So I, I had I had what I thought was quite a competent sample of participants. Now, the claims that you know RIR prescription is highly limited by one's accuracy in that um, most people, right, uh, unable to accurately tr- predict RIR, that comes from research that is mostly conducted in untrained individuals, right? So it's important when making this claim, you're specific about the demographic of individuals you're speaking about. Recently, there has been a meta-analysis by Halper and, and colleagues that showed on average across all research studies, participants are likely out. So they're likely oh, about one repetition away from the RIR target, right? So they're about, out by about one rep, which isn't too bad. So I usually say in practice with my clients, you know, on average, if you're within a rep of the RIR target I prescribe, you're probably, you know, in the ballpark uh, area that's going that, that we're going to need long term to, to get us to where we want to be, right? So an RIR prescription strategy and, an, and the subsequent prediction that follows that doesn't have to be perfect for it to work really well, right? It has to be close enough over time and hopefully over time it actually gets closer and closer and there's certain strategies you can implement to ensure an individual is getting closer and closer and more accurate over time like for example actually pushing them to failure like i said i wanted i wanted to gauge the accuracy of my participants and so on the barbell bench press uh what i did before the trials began was i told i put my participants through two sets to failure, so momentary muscular failure, on two separate occasions. And I told them on one set to to call out when they reached a three RIR, when they perceived to have reached a three RIR, but then they'd continue pushing to failure. And on the other set, um, I, I told them to call out when they perceived to have reached a one RIR, right? And then again, they'd continue pushing to failure. So this is the method that I employed to actually gauge the accuracy of their predictions by working out the difference between where they predicted, right? So their predicted RIR and their actual RIR. Now, this data is actually soon to be published. And so uh, I hope to show that, you know, trained individuals who actually have some RIR experience can be quite accurate with their predictions. And so you can use RIR prescription, right? So if you're using RIR prescription with your clients, right? If you're a coach and using it with your clients and it's simply not working because they're not accurate, it's not really a fault of the method itself, I don't think. It's really a fault of the way it's being coached. So mm-hmm. just like any method, you have to coach it appropriately and you have to individualize it to the client. Would I give an RIR prescription to someone who's never trained before? Likely not. Someone who's been training for, you know, six plus years and has some experience training to failure? Potentially, yes. Doesn't have to be right away. But eventually, I think I could get to that point, at least after I fine-tuned their training. So what I found was that when participants were predicting a one RIR, 
they were about 0.4 repetitions away from the target, right? So let's just think about this for a second. So we've got, if we were one repetition away from that one RIR target, you'd, you'd be at a two RIR or a zero, zero RIR, yeah. right? You're one repetition away. They were 0.4 repetitions away. So less than half a repetition away on average from the one RIR target, which is pretty accurate if you ask me. I'm not sure how much more accurate we can get across uh, multiple so each participant had two attempts, right, at predicting a one RIR. And across 24 participants, so about 48 predictions, I suppose, um, that's that 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 was the accuracy, right? Less than half repetition away. With the three RIR, as I hypothesized, the accuracy uh, participants were a little more inaccurate. So they were about 0.65 repetitions away from the target three RIR. So still under a rep, but just over half a rep. Um, actually, that, no, sorry. So it was 0.9 repetitions away, so just under a rep. And then if we look at the the combined score of both one and three RIR together, so if we look at all RIR predictions together, the, the average was 0.65 repetitions away from the target, either one or three RIR. So that, that's kind of a good overall uh, gauge of the participant's accuracy, independent of the actual target they were reaching for. That instilled confidence in me and confidence in my participants' abilities to reach a given RIR target. So when we then moved on to the actual experimental trials that were looking at neuromuscular fatigue, I already had uh, some groundwork built up here that suggested my participants would actually be pretty close to the targets that, I, that I'd set for them. Because in the experimental trials, I had those three conditions, so three RIR, one RIR, and failure. And so in the, th in the RIR conditions, participants were required to completely terminate their sets when they got to that RIR target. And what I did was I assessed the fatigue response to set termination at either the one or the three RIR. So that's how the trial played out. Now, when it comes to the results that were found, this was the first study that observed a, a linear relationship between neuromuscular, between proximity to failure in resistance training, right, determined by reps and reserve, and neuromuscular fatigue, right? And again, that maps on to our previous intuitions, which stated that, you know, the claim stated that you know, as you get closer to failure, fatigue increases. But then we have that second, that second part of the claim where it was common to hear that you know fatigue is disproportionate when you reach failure right or it's exponential when you reach failure and so i was also able to quantify right the differences between reaching a one rir right and actually reaching the point of failure and so it did actually seem that the relationship between rir right proximity to failure and fatigue was somewhat exponential because what I found on average was that the failure condition experienced a 25% decrease in lifting velocity um, right after resistance training. So this is, I'm now talking about the acute fatigue that I assessed within the session, right? So I, I not only assessed delayed fatigue, which we're going to get to soon, but I also assessed acute fatigue that occurred in the session, right? So how fatiguing is training to a specific proximity to failure within the training session itself? Right, so before I get to the results, I'll just backtrack a little bit. Um, with each of these three conditions, the participants performed the bench press exercise and they completed six sets in a row with four minutes rest in between. Right Now, of course, in practice, you're unlikely to perform six sets straight on the same exercise. You might do three sets of bench press, three sets of chest flies. But I tried to emulate um, a resistance training workout. Right, So you know, most people at least perform six sets for a given muscle group in a session if they're trying to trying to build muscle. And four minutes is probably on the top end of like the general rest recommendations that you here get, you know, thrown around. So I would say it's it's quite a, a decent amount of, of rest. And so that's that's the protocol, right, that these results are based on, right? It's six sets on an exercise for the same muscle group with four minutes rest in between. And real like quick, I said, in real yep. quick, are, are yep. these are these participants doing any other training outside of that? Or are they only doing the, the bench? They they weren't doing any training that would influence uh, the results. So okay. they were doing some some additional uh, upper body training like uh, rows and and arms, um, but they and some some light leg training, but they weren't doing it at a time point that would influence gotcha. the the result. Yeah, and that's a good question. Um, and in response to to that protocol, like I said earlier, training to failure came with a 25% decrease in lifting velocity, which was my measure of fatigue. And training at a one RIR came with a 13% decrease, 
right? So we've got 25%, we've got 13%, and then three RIR was an 8% decrease, right? So eight to 13, yeah, bit of a difference there, but 13 to 25, a large difference there. So again, that that's kind of highlighting the somewhat exponential relationship between proximity to failure and neuromuscular fatigue. Right, whereby fatigue increases as you get closer to failure, but once you reach the point of failure, it rises disproportionately. So, so that was the the unique aspect of my study, being able to quantify those differences. Now, again, this is this is speaking about acute fatigue in the session itself. Now, I also tested fatigue twenty four and forty eight hours post resistance training, and I found very minimal differences between the conditions in that post-training period. So either the protocol itself, right, six sets on the bench press wasn't fatiguing enough to allow for any differences to be detected in the post-training period, or participants were simply able to recover quite well from that, from the protocols, right? Whether they were training to failure or to to three RIR. So I think when we're speaking about proximity, proximity to failure and the fatigue response, it's common to hear about the information in the context of like post-workout fatigue, right? So we don't want to do any training that's going to influence subsequent workouts. And of course, that has to be consideration. But I would say if your training split is designed in a strategic way, that mitigates the the concerns, the potential concerns of fatigue from a session influencing the subsequent session, right? Yes, for legs, you know, maybe for, for legs, it's it's a bit more of a concern. For upper body, if you're training muscle groups two to three times a week, you can design a training split in a way that mitigates some of those post-workout fatigue concerns. I think it's important we also dial our attention into the fatigue we're accumulating within our tr- training, right? Because that can also influence the stimulus we're achieving, right? I usually give the example of forming multiple sets for a given exercise, right? Just as a kind of a thought experiment, if you performed you know, 10 sets, let's say, for, for a given exercise with four minutes rest in between and you push them all to failure, right? The stimulus achieved in that first set compared to the last set is clearly going to be, it's going to be different even if you're still reaching the point of failure because of the fatigue that's accumulated. So my programming kind of philosophy is based on that thought experiment, right? If we know that fatigue can alter the stimulus achieved across multiple sets, then what do we have to do to try and maintain the level of that stimulus across a whole session? Maybe we can remove some sets. Maybe we can rest longer in between um, uh, the exercise. Maybe we can adjust exercises. We don't have to do the same exercise for 10 sets in a row. We can, we can stimulate the, the same area of, of a same area of musculature in a slightly different way, right? So there's so many different methods you can implement to mitigate the effect of fatigue on the stimulus across a session. That's that's kind of where my thoughts originate. My study allowed me to to see how this all played out on the level of acute fatigue in in in, in the session itself. And like I said, in that post workout period, participants either recovered very well or the workout just wasn't right uh, taxing enough. Those are the main uh, main findings in regards to fatigue. Now, you know, it's up to you, Jeff. We can either speak about sex differences or we can speak about some of the perceptual responses that I also measure. So I looked at discomfort and perceived exertion, et cetera. Yeah. Real quick before we dive into those. So, so you yep. looked at post-workout fatigue and then you also looked at like days after, right? So you had immediately yep. after and then days after. And so just, just to make sure so I understand. So uh, right after the workout, when they did go to failure, the fatigue was exponentially higher, right? You said like went from yep. like 13% or velocity loss was like 13% to like 25%. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But when you looked at 24 in 48 hours, you did see that that go down substantial amount. Correct. Yeah. So there was still minor differences at the 24 hour time point where the failure condition uh, was still experiencing fatigue experienced some fatigue. So their lifting velocity hadn't returned to baseline 24 hours post-training compared to the a one RIR and three RIR conditions. But the, the differences were very minor. So the question is, you know, how practically relevant are they, right? Well, we don't know unless we actually, you know, put that to the test in in another study. But um, that was the case in the 24-hour time point. And then at the 48-hour time point, all conditions had returned to baseline. So they were all recovered and there were no differences there between conditions. I guess then, and, and we may hit on this uh, throughout, like uh, as, as we go yep. through this, but in, in terms of how you would go about, I, I guess really then the issue would be if you do go to failure, it's going to be that the the work, the sets volume and the subsequent sets of that mm-hmm. workout that are going to 
be hampered by going to failure essentially than the most is is that what I, am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, you are. So okay. so my thoughts have shifted kind of over time with how you know, train to failure can can influence um, the 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 long term adaptations to training. So yes, there still is a concern in the post workout period, right? And and this also depends on like where you are in your training program and how novel the exercises are. Of course, a novel stimulus. Um, is going to have a larger uh, effect on post-workout recovery than a stimulus you're accustomed to. Uh, and so, yes, you know, you'd be correct in saying that that's what my my study highlighted. It's that within the session itself, pushing to failure has, or at least pushing closer to failure, has a larger impact on the fatigue response and how that can influence you know, the productiveness of a session, your productiveness, what is that? How, how are we going to qualify productiveness? Well, it comes down to the to the long-term goals of the program. With strength, right, that fatigue is going to inf- to be, be a detriment to your ability to lift heavy loads, which are the stimulus for strength gains, right, specifically neural adaptations. And from a hypertrophy standpoint, if we also know that fatigue can alter the amount of tension, right, and um, force, a muscle can produce well there's likely a, a relationship happening there as well across multiple sets for the same muscle group which is why you know a low volume high intensity approach is quite a quite a good approach a, a quite a common approach that yields good results is because you're 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 um making up for some of that additional compensating for some of that additional fatigue with a lower a lower overall volume and so limiting the potential effect of that fatigue on the stimulus achieved across multiple sets. So, you know, whether you're taking a, a high volume, low intensity approach or vice versa, end outcomes probably going to be similar. Um, yes, there's pros and cons to each of them. Um, you know, personally, I like to sit somewhere in the middle. So like a moderate volume approach with a fairly high intensity, uh, because I think there are benefits to to squeezing in more volume via the addition of sets, if possible, and if one can tolerate that, versus keeping sets very very low and pushing them all to to failure. So I think there's pros and cons to each, and yeah, that's that's where my thoughts are at at the moment with that. Okay, cool. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I uh, un- understood that part. So um, I know you kind of gave me two options. I think it was a sex differences, and I can't remember what the other one was. I'm fine with either. You, I'll, I'll let you kind of take the. Yeah. the take that um, cool. which direction you want to go there with that yeah cool I, I think an interesting point is that this relationship i'm describing between proximity failure and fatigue and how how pushing to failure you know has that somewhat exponential effect versus even just keeping one rep in reserve it's important to realize that this is more so observed in males versus versus females so the one of the key findings was that this relationship was was much stronger in males, whereas in females, it was actually more of a linear relationship. So what I mean by this is pushing to failure, when females push to failure, the fatigue cost wasn't exponentially greater than the fatigue cost of just pushing two or one RIR, right? So, you know, if you can kind of visualize how that may look for females, going from three RIR to one RIR to failure comes with the same proportionate increase in fatigue, whereas for males, three RIR and one RIR comes with a certain uh, difference in fatigue, but then one RIR to failure, a much larger difference. So this does seem to highlight a bit of a sex difference that has been uh, definitely hypothesized over the years, a bit of a sex difference in fatigue. So there's, there's a lot of previous research that highlights uh, these potential sex differences whereby females either recover faster than, than males or they fatigue less during training. But there haven't been any studies that have tested this potential sex difference in the context that I was testing it. So, you know, uh, I, I think I employed a a protocol that is similar to what may be employed in practice versus maybe using um, other types of resistance training methods that are sometimes used in in research, like isometric contractions, for example, and testing the fatigue difference between 
you know, holding an isometric contraction for a certain amount of time. So that combined with the fact that I used RIR makes makes my study and the comparison of sex differences a bit unique. And what I found was that when males and females trained to a three RIR or a one RIR, the fatigue response was similar between sexes. But as we then took it to failure, that started to change, right? And differences started to be observed. Now, you may say, well, what if what if the male simply, you know, pushed, actually pushed to true failure? Maybe the females weren't actually pushing to failure, right? Maybe maybe the men were just, just had a better ability to take themselves to failure and to grind out reps. Now, what I did to, I guess, bulletproof myself from that criticism was I tracked the velocity of all the reps. So the speed of the the last rep before failure in the males, right? The speed was zero on average 0.14 meters a second, right? So this is the last rep before failure. So it's our zero RIR rep, right? So 0.14 meters a second. Now, for the females, it was actually slower. So what this means is that females were grinding out slower reps as they got closer to failure. Before females, the average was 0.12 meters a second, just under 0.14. Right, so the speed of the reps for both sexes as they approached failure was very, very similar, which highlights that, right, the the females must have pushed just as hard as males, must have grinded reps just as hard as males, if not, you know, harder. And on top of that, what I also did to try and bulletproof my findings a bit further, and again, these are all things that kind of building off previous research, trying to fill the gaps in previous research, um, because you know, there's lots of limitations to what has been done in the past. And I guess that's what we're trying to do as researchers. So we're trying to address those limitations and and improve the way studies are designed. So Jeff, you could imagine if if you reach the point of failure on a bench press and you're trying to grind that last rep, right? And you just kind of stay there. You're just grinding and grinding and grinding. You're just stuck and you're, you're stuck for like 10 seconds. Could you imagine how fatigued you would be compared to just being stuck for two seconds? Right. So even though you're reaching the point of failure, the amount of time that you're grinding for under the barbell will influence the fatigue response. Right. So what I did was I ensured that I only gave participants two seconds, right, to grind out that rep. If it was if the bar was stuck for two seconds, I'd re rack it. So I tried to even control for the amount of fatigue generated um, on that, you know, final attempt to overcome the point of failure right so i think that was that was a really interesting finding and uh, it, it could be that the four minute rest period simply wasn't enough for the males to recover uh sufficiently enough when they reached the point of failure right now whether that be due to the heavier load they were lifting whether that potentially be to um the size of the muscle and the increased uh, stimulation that likely experience and the increased arterial occlusion that a larger muscle likely experiences. So larger muscles likely experience more occlusion um, upon muscular contractions. And that can obviously influence the amount of peripheral fatigue experienced and the ability for um, the muscle to uh, get rid of some of the metabolic byproducts in between workout in between um, resistance training bouts or in between sets. So it could be due to that, due to that as well. There's a few hypothesized reasons, um, but you know, either, either these reasons alone or a combination of many likely yielded those results. And so in practice, if we have clients who are men, who are males pushing to failure and we want them to push to failure, maybe they've got a low, low intensity approach, probably a good idea to increase that rest period Versus with females, we can probably be a bit more lenient with that, and we probably have room to to push harder, more consistently over time, because we know there's going to be less of a fatigue cost to reaching that point of failure with a with a given you know fixed rest period in between sets. So I ho- hope that makes sense as well. Yeah, and and that seems like that's like you said, kind of in line with like what you would like, kind of what we in, in terms of like what like you said, what we thought about like when yeah. recovering a little bit quicker than, than the males, like that, that seems to be what, what it was we thought ahead of like before as well. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think, I think to take steps a bit further and to, to take this a bit further to make it a little bit more complicated, 
um, if you look through the paper, you'll notice that the graphs that I've plotted not only show group averages, but they show individual responses, right? And this is something that, again, future research needs to do more of because, Jeff, you have to remember that when you're interpreting research, for the most part, you're interpreting group averages, right? So we compare a group versus a group because it's not enough to compare just one person against the other. We want to have a certain sample size split into groups and so on. But that group average is obviously made up of individual responses that can vary and in some cases can vary widely. So on some of my graphs, you'll see individual dot points that are color-coded based on sex. So men and women, males and females. And what you see is differences in the fatigue cost, even within the the female uh, group themselves, right? In the group of females. So what I mean by this is some females did experience more fatigue than some of the males, right? It just happens that on average, right, the males experienced more fatigue. This also uh, holds for our for my perceptual assessments of fatigue. So for example, before sessions commenced, I asked the participants how recovered they felt, right? And it was it's known as a perceived recovery uh, scale that, that we used. And some females perceived to have been more recovered than the males and, and vice versa. So that also varied, right? And what I also found there is that even though some people felt that they were recovered, right? Sometimes that didn't actually map on to the objective outcomes that I then observed. So some people, some participants would come to the gym, I'd ask them how recovered they felt. And they would say, I'm, I feel 100%. I don't feel any soreness. I'm ready to go. But upon lifting the barbell and testing their lifting velocity, which was my measure of fatigue, I still observed some fatigue. And the opposite, right? On the flip side, I also saw people who said that they were uh, indeed under recovered that they felt like they couldn't perform very well but they came to the gym and their lifting velocity was back to baseline right so remember we're comparing the velocity at a give at a fixed load right and of course if you can't lift a, a fixed load at the velocity that you could when you were fresh well you're fatigued and it, that's a very reliable, reliable measure of fatigue so although these sex differences existed or were observed on average it's important to realize that as coaches we still need to treat our clients as individuals so really this this highlights the difference between taking a top down and a bottom up approach to your programming so what i mean by this is taking a bottom up approach would mean when you bring a new client in you consult with them your your programming simply based on what you know about them so it's bottoms up it's only the client nothing else. Top-down approach would be taking broad recommendations that we get from research and that we have from experience. Now, what we need to do when we're working with clients is, especially with new clients, is yes, we want to have some extent a bottom-up approach because we need the program to be individualized, but we really don't know too much about the client when we first start working with them. It takes a bit of time to actually build up our understanding of the client and how they respond. So, we want to use a top-down approach, which means, to some extent, we want to implement a top-down approach, which means if we have a female, we can kind of use some of the understanding that we have from research and we can say, okay, well, on average, females you are know, um, less fatigable than males, so I should consider that to some extent in my programming. But then over time, we should be taking more of a bottom-up approach right? because we get to know the client more and we might realize that that female is actually quite fatigable and, you know, is a bit of an outlier, or at least in this study would have been a bit of an outlier compared to the rest. So we're moving from top down to bottom up, which allows for more of an individualized approach. So that can only be the case though, after weeks and months of working with the same client, I'm sure you've been there before. The first program you write for a client, the first plan you set out is really an educated guess for the most part. And you're trying to use broad recommendations But then eventually you might realize that some of those recommendations just don't suit the client you're working with because of individual differences. So I think the results of my study did a good good job at at highlighting the importance of considering, right, broad group averages and what we generally know, but also the client themselves 
and the individual response that is observed, you know, when you, when you work with a client. Yeah, no, absolutely. Right. I think it's, yeah, it's important to, again, kind of have a general outline, but then, like you said, you, you're going to get the client's feedback on that. And then you're going to start to really individualize it based, based on them. Because like you said, you had some people in there that they did fatigue, some people didn't mm-hmm. as much. And so you really just, you, you can only figure that out by, by trial and error um, at that point. So um, cool. Was there any other like findings or results or anything like that, that you, that you wanted to uh, share on, on, on this particular study? Yeah, but those were the the main findings. I think the, the common follow-up question is also, well, you know, how does, how do these findings map onto, to longer term uh, outcomes like hypertrophy and strength? And we really don't know exactly how specific RIRs will influence long-term resistance training outcomes because, again, previous research has only compared failure and non-failure training for the most part. So we can make assumptions and hypothesize as to how things may play out. Um, But I'm trying now to look into that further. So with my final PhD study, I think I alluded to to this earlier, I'm I'm running a long-term training intervention comparing... Uh, so it's a unilateral training intervention, which means um, all participants will be training both of their legs, but they'll be training their legs in a slightly different way. So they'll be training one leg to failure across an eight to 10 week period. And the opposing leg will be keeping some reps in reserve. So it'll be keeping two reps in reserve, for example, on the leg press and one rep in reserve on the leg extension. So still close to failure, right? But not reaching failure. And that's going to allow us to tease out Um, differences between the legs in regards to muscle hypertrophy and assess what's happening when we know the clients are pushing close to failure, but they're not actually reaching failure. Whereas in previous research, it's, they could be 50%. They could be doing 50% of the maximum repetitions they possibly could. Maybe on some sets, they are close to failure. It's a little more ambiguous. And I'm trying again to advance our current understanding and hopefully dig a bit deeper and actually understand how RIR itself um, influences long-term adaptations versus just pushing to, to failure, right? At least on the legs, on the quadriceps specifically. So, so does that mean in that study then that you would kind of figure out like what the, what the stimulus would be then like long-term on that? Because I, I would imagine the the downside with doing a single like training session would be, you wouldn't be able to to find that out. Am I understanding that correctly or am I... So, so yeah, there's a, there's a bit more detail that goes into the study design itself. But uh, basically, participants will be training twice a week. They'll be training their legs, both their legs on both those uh, occasions. So they'll be training their quads twice a week. Like I said, the proximity to failure achieved on each of those legs is going to be different. Right. Um, the exercises performed will be the leg press and the leg extension. And this is going to happen over a long, long-term uh, period, which means I'll be able to assess hypertrophy. Um, and hopefully the hypertrophy experience will be enough to detect over the 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 time period in my trained sample. And what I'm doing to to ensure that um, the, the the participants build muscle that can be detected is i'm I'm individualizing the volume that is prescribed. So a lot of previous studies simply recruit participants and prescribe a universal volume allocation. So I might say, okay, 20 participants here, they're all going to do 10 sets uh, per week for a muscle group, right? Or 15, whatever it is. Now, Jeff, you can imagine if if 10 of those participants have been training with 20 sets per week and the other 10 have only been doing five sets, right? They just haven't been doing low volume approaches. Bringing everyone to 10 will mean, probably mean that some people are detraining, right? And some people are now, training heaps more than they previously were. Maybe even, who knows, overtraining to the point where they experience minor strains, injuries that disable them from from training productively. So that can lead to, that can confound the progress experienced across the intervention period, right? Especially if someone's detraining, doing less volume, much less volume than what they're exposed to. So participants in this study will be completing the same amount of volume in regards to set volume as they previously have been. Uh, and that volume will will increase at some point throughout the intervention period as well. So that's the design. And I think I'll be able to, you know, at the end of 
um, this intervention period, we're going to have a much clearer idea as to how proximity to failure itself influences long-term hypertrophy, right, versus pushing to failure. Yeah, because, and I was going to ask that, and then, you know, as, as you came up with that study design, because again, with with the one that you did, you're mostly just looking at the fatigue aspect, not necessarily the, the stimulus of the hyper, of hypertrophy with that. Yes. So, so this is what this next exactly. one is going to do. It's going to take that next step to, to figure that out. Exactly. Uh, whilst looking uh, to some extent at long, longer term fatigue as well. So yeah, you know, what's happening to volume load week to week? What's happening to the reps performed week to week? The um, lifting velocity week to week? Because yeah, we know now how things work on the level of just one session. But what about multiple weeks strung mm-hmm. together? Right. Right. And too, I like how you're, um, you are in visualizing the volume, because I do think that is going to be a big aspect of, of it as well, too. Like you said, based on the studies, it's like, sometimes they just give them this blanket number and it's like, is that mm-hmm. going to be enough for that person? Is it not going to be enough? Right. Yeah. Like you said, there's a lot of yeah. things that go into it. So, sure. so that's awesome that you're uh, standardizing for that. So I guess then from the, from the, the study that you, that was just published, you know, what would maybe be some like practical takeaways for either, you know, just people that want to train on their own and, or, um, a coach programming for uh, uh, a client. Yeah. So uh, if, if, um, if you're listening and interested, feel free to check out the the paper. So the paper is open access and there's a, a long practical application section in there. So I, I always try and have a practical application section in, I love it in my uh, research uh, that kind of distills everything and, and makes it easy to understand. But basically if, if we know that uh, in men, the right training to failure comes with a high amount of fatigue. We just have to be smart about the way that's programmed. So we have to consider set volume, right, within a session and, of course, across the week. And uh, if if we're pushing close to failure, then we need to potentially employ lower set volumes and longer time courses of recovery in between sessions. So, again, the training split has to be accounted for here. Um, and I think... The, the the fact that we saw the the numbers themselves um so the, the you know the the 25 percent increase um in in fatigue or a decrease in lifting velocity when failure was reached and we saw that number compared to the one rir right which is only 13 percent right that gives us a good idea of you know how fatiguing at least the bench press can be so what we have to understand is that you know, the results we're discussing here they're they're based on the context of the the study design which right. which involved the bench press now this gives us a bit of a clue mm-hmm. right this gives us a bit of a clue to how things may play out on other exercises as well but as coaches as practitioners and people or trainees we have to also take ownership of you know interpreting interpreting the the information here and it may be different on some other exercises now my guess is that it's similar it's a similar trend across exercises. The magnitude of fatigue may just be greater depending on the exercise itself and the features and demands of the exercise. So, for example, on a hack squat or a um, RDL, for example, we may see that same trend, but the total magnitude of fatigue experienced because of the nature of the exercise would be uh, different. You know, I hope that with this study design and with the results uh, and the way it's written, I hope uh, people realize that, you know, we're not saying that just because failure comes with a high amount of fatigue that you shouldn't train to failure, right? And again, that's the concern with some previous research, which has um, kind of put failure training against non-failure training, right? Almost making them seem as completely different things when in reality, it's just this is all happening on a spectrum. So if you're pushing to failure, you want to choose exercises in which there is very limited safety concerns, right? And you you want to prescribe failure training to mostly to clients who can recover well, so maybe more so to females versus males. We also have to consider the perceptual response to training to failure as well and pushing hard, especially as practitioners working with a wide range of clients. Because what I found, you know, a, a side note here, what I, another finding in, in the study was that the general feeling to pushing to failure varied across individuals. So some people, when they pushed to failure, they felt they felt good, like, yeah, give me more, even though it hurt, they wanted more. Others were like, 
man, I'm done. I feel like crap. Uh, I don't want to be training anymore. So the perceptual response is important. And when you become a coach or when you are a coach, sorry, and you work with a wide range of people, you, know, you soon realize how important it is to, to consider someone's perceptual response for adherence and for many other reasons. So yes, pushing close to failure, reaching failure in some cases, yeah, maybe quote unquote optimal, but what is the cost of that, right? So we have to consider not just what's happening objectively right, on the gym floor, but what's also happening perceptually, right? How's the client feeling? So a few things going on there. Um, and hopefully, yeah, that that gives the the listeners some things to to think about. Yeah, I think uh if you if you dig into the paper, check out the practical application section and there's a there's a few more notes there that you might be interested in. Yeah, absolutely. I love that you do the practical application because I think that is that is super important. But just a couple notes here on this. Like I definitely anecdotally now, you know, thinking back on like going to failure, like specifically on the bench press, like that that rest of that session definitely just was not as as great as it you know if mm-hmm. I in the times when I didn't go um, to failure. And again, I'm assuming when we say failure, we're talking like you you can't get another yeah rep basically correct. at that point, right? Well, it's not even that you can't get another rep it's that good form you, you fail the yeah well you fail the rep that you're currently in and so you know it's not that because a zero rir technically would be like okay i can't get another rep if i tried but going to failure is technically attempting that next rep and not yeah, and right. then failing in that rep right that right. that is that is failure itself and mm-hmm. you also have to consider that what we're talking about there is just observing failure but whether or not the muscle has experienced complete exhaustion fatigue is also a little bit different because sometimes you just may not be able to you know the resistance profiles and so on come into play and this discussion can go on and on <laughs> but you know on on something like a bench press because it's much harder at the bottom than it is at the top there comes a point where you may simply be unable to overcome kind of the the, the resistance curve Right. of the exercise and not even move it off your chest. Now, for the bench press, it's not that bad because usually participants, people do get it off their chest and then come to a sticking point. So they do have to grind, right? But some other exercises, you can get to the point where the resistance curve is leads to the exercise being so hard at the bottom right, that you don't even get a chance to kind of overcome the, the rep. And so whether or not the muscles experience complete fatigue and it's reached failure is, is questionable. And that's why you've got to incorporate exercise with different resistance profiles, so that the muscle gets stimulated in all areas of the of the range of motion across the session. Yeah, I mean, this these this this topic is is so um interesting and complex, right? We can we can go on for days. There there is a lot of nuance in it, right? Because like you said, yeah. then like you said, it comes down to the exercise selection. So so there you really can go down a deep rabbit hole. But but with this, but again, the the big thing is that you you want it to get some sort of research out there in in um terms of like hey. The bench press, you know, we can standardize this and, and and this is what happens there with that. But again, like potentially, you know, exercise selection, all these things could theoretically change, you know, the the velocity loss, things like that. But also I like how you brought up too in this going to failure for one person is going to be completely different than another yeah. person. And I'm sure that's going to affect the magnitude of fatigue as well too um, in the process, yeah. which uh, again, like you said, there's so many rabbit holes you can go down with with yeah, this yeah. concept. So, and that's that's the downside with research, right? Is there's only so mm-hmm. much you can do with it, and you're uh, limited by the the study design and everything. But I think you did a great mm-hmm. job, you know, working through those potential uh, limitations, as you know, um, with with the RIR. So, uh, yeah, I think overall was great. Was there anything else that you wanted to hit on on this before we wrap up? Yeah, and uh, maybe maybe the final point, just really yeah. considering the individual response, which you you alluded to there. So, yeah, a big part of the study was also investigating that and the variability in the perceptual responses and how some people felt recovered when in fact they weren't or or vice versa. Uh, That's all really important in practice and can be the difference between, you know, a sustainable and productive mesocycle of training, right, that consistently exposes an individual to a sufficient stimulus that promotes adaptation versus, you know, consistently being under that. Uh, simply due to perceptions, right? Either of your RIR accuracy or your recovery. And so as coaches, it's important we consider the individual subjective feedback because subjective feedback is important, right? It's not just we dismiss that because it's subjective, right? We account for that, but we also have other metrics that we also need to have other metrics that we assess um, to make our decisions, right? As coaches and especially as trainees, if we don't have anyone guiding us, it can sometimes be a little bit tricky to make decisions uh, when you've got to battle with your own perceptions and then also try to interpret the objective numbers and information that you're 
recording, right, from your training sessions. Absolutely, yeah. You, you want that subjective data, but you also, and, but you have to combine it with the objective. So you need, you know, you need both, and you and you cross reference, mm-hmm. right? And so that's where that you get into the nuances of it all. But um, but yeah, no, it'll be cool to see your uh, next study come out. When any idea? I, I know you're. It's it's a long process. Um, what is what yeah. is that going to look like? Hopefully, hopefully later this year. So I've got another um, twenty or so weeks in the lab, aka the gym four um <laughs> and hopefully yeah it'll be published by the end of the year or early 2024 awesome yeah I, like i told you uh, before we we hopped on i was talking to milo and, and he's doing a couple studies as well and he's like yeah we got okay. one that's almost done it's a, a couple months away and then he said the other one's like one to two years i'm like man it's just wow such a slow yeah. slow process you know to, to get it all done yeah. so yeah martin uh, again appreciate your time um uh, probably let you go is there anywhere uh where you want to lead the audience to and or anything coming up for you that you want to let them know about. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Check me out on, uh, on Instagram. If you like MR fitness with a double underscore. Uh, and if you're uh, interested in the research, uh, you can find my research on research gate or just search my name up in PubMed and yeah, some of the research will pop up. So thankfully some of it is open access and you should be able to access more of the, the, the recent uh, research that I put out there. Yeah. I got the one uh, study pulled up that we went over. So yeah, I'll make sure to, yeah. to link that in there for you. So again, Thanks. Martin, appreciate your time in and we'll have you on again in the future. No worries. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you.